Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Well, here we are again uh, around the Word of God. And I, I don't know of a, a place that I'd rather be than in the study of the Word of God with you. If you have a copy of the Word, turn with me to Acts of the Apostles, Acts chapter number 2, and just kind of hold your place right there. We're going to be looking at a powerful, powerful Word today uh, from the Scriptures uh, around the third, probably most uh, important holiday that you and I will ever enjoy. Uh, of course, Easter is the big holiday that we celebrate uh, the Savior having risen from the dead. Then December 25th is the birth of the Lord Jesus. And then, I, in my opinion, the, the third greatest holiday that we celebrate is uh, Pentecost. Uh, Pentecost is a uh, a tremendous holiday for the child of God. It occurs 50 days after Easter. And it is the day that the church came into existence, where the kingdom of God was birthed in the hearts and lives of his people. Uh, it, it was a powerful day that continues even now. I, I'm convinced uh, that this old universe of ours is winding down. And there's going to come a day when God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And, and just about everything that we know is really winding down except the body of Christ, except the church, you and me. Some time ago, my wife and I had uh, gone to Israel and uh, we came back through London and we stayed for a few days there. And one of the things that I wanted to do was I wanted to check out all of the churches. And much to my dismay, most of the churches in London had closed up. Many of them had been bought by pubs and other kinds of shops. But there was one particular church that I wanted to go see called Spurgeon's Tabernacle. And I kept asking about Spurgeon's Tabernacle, where it was, and nobody could help me. Nobody could tell me. Nobody could remember it. Uh, I later learned that it was better known in these days as the Metropolitan uh, Church there in London. So we finally made our way over there, and I'd read so much and studied so much about that marvelous historical work of God. When I got there, I was amazed to find that what once was somewhere around a 5,000 seat auditorium had been reduced to about 700 and only a handful of people uh, attend there. And it was heartbreaking. Uh, I'm told, and I don't know how true that this is, but there will be approximately 5% of the churches in America that will have to close their doors because of the effect of the pandemic. 5% of the churches will not reopen because they have been completely decimated. Now you say, Pastor, did the pandemic do that? No, uh, it did not. I want to tell you why churches close their doors. I want to tell you why churches die. It's because they quit doing what God told them to do. One of my great concerns in my lifetime is, God, I, I don't want First Baptist Church Indian Trail to go backwards. God, I don't want us to die. I want us to remain vibrant. God, you've had your hand on us for all of these years. And God, you've taken us a lot further than we ever dreamed that we would ever go. And, and my heart's desire and my prayer to God is that he would keep his hand on this ministry. That he would keep blessing us with his blessing. You understand that when people quit doing what the Lord tells them to do, you can expect the hand of God to be withdrawn and the glory of the Lord will depart. I want to ask all of you now as we gather in our homes and other places to hear this message, how many of you could honestly and genuinely and sincerely say, God, I don't want you to stop blessing my life. God, I don't want you to stop blessing my family. 
God, would you keep your hand on my business? And God, please, keep pouring out your blessings on our church. How many of you would honestly say, Pastor, that, that's the desire of my heart. I, I want the blessings of God in all of those areas. Well, I've sat down and I've looked at this passage of Scripture intensely. And I picked out about eight things here in this New Testament church that uh, I believe evoked the blessing of God on them. And I want to relate them to you. I hope you got a pen and maybe a piece of paper and you can write some of this down. And I want to give you eight things I believe that you and I must do according to the Word of God here that if we want to see God continue to bless our lives, bless our families, bless the work of our hands, and to bless our church. Are you ready? Here we go. What I see here in this passage, first of all, is that you have to depend on the Holy Spirit. You have to pray and seek God and only the power that He has to offer us if you expect God to continue to bless your life. May I say to you that uh, it's pretty obvious our government does not have the Holy Spirit. Uh, I would say to you that science doesn't have and receive the Holy Spirit. I can say to you that corporations don't have the Holy Spirit. Only the church has the power of the Holy Spirit of God to keep us living lives and to keep us from living lives uh, on our own. You, you understand that the great task of the church is to bring people to Jesus. The great task of our church and our lives is to populate heaven with others. But the good news about that is, praise God, we don't have to do it in our own strength. We don't have to do it in our own power. God gives us the power to do what he has assigned us to do. I want you to listen closely now to verse 1 and 2 in Acts chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord and in one place. And suddenly, now here comes three miracles. Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting powerful word go on to verse 3 and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and it set upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance three miracles jumped out Immediately, as the power of the Holy Spirit fell on their lives. The Bible says when the Holy Spirit showed up, uh, there was a sound. And there was as fire. And the Bible says that they spoke in other languages. Now, the symbol of the church is the fact that it is to be powerful that lives are being changed. These are the symbols of those miracles. The church is to be filled with power. The church is to experience life change. People that are going to be on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and they, there is a warmth in the congregation. But oh, friend, it's to be multicultural uh, as well. Look at verse 43 in that same chapter. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you and I are in the midst of a pandemic. And we're being told a lot of things about that pandemic. Matter of fact, I'm scratching my head about all of it. But the fact of the matter is, in the middle of what we are facing right now, we need God's power. We are in desperate need of God's power. The second thing here that I want to show you uh, that if we're going to receive the blessings of God is that we have to distribute our language. To distribute our language. Pick it up now in verse 5, if you will. 
And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes, Elamites and the dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Serene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Now, let me just say to you, the tongues that we're reading about here in the second chapter of Acts is nowhere near the same that you're going to discover when Paul is writing to the church at Corinth in that 14th chapter. Uh, entirely different purpose, entirely different interpretation and meanings. Here in chapter 2, it was an understandable, discernible language communicating in the dialects of the various people that had come from all over the known world. And there they could hear German, they could hear French, and they could hear uh, whatever the language, Congolese, if you will. It just showed up and they could understand it. You see, God reversed the curse that occurred in Genesis chapter 11. You all know that story how that the people of the earth got together and they said, hey, let's just build us a tower that'll reach all the way into heaven. And then they wanted to fashion them a God that they could worship and God wouldn't have anything to do with it. He said, none of that. And so he cast a curse on them, a, a curse of languages. And, and, and all of a sudden they couldn't understand one another. And, and, and they had different uh, uh, dialects and different languages that scattered them all over the known world. Some of them went to Asia, some of them went to Africa, some of them went to Europe and all over the world at that time, uh, just separated by the language. And here in this passage, God reverses that in order that verse 11 might come out so that everybody could hear in their own language what the Bible says, the great things of God. Now here's the beautiful part. We don't need that miracle anymore. You say, why is that, Pastor? Why don't we need that miracle? I, 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 don't, I, I don't speak but uh, one or two languages. Why, why don't we need that miracle? Well, you're more linguistic than you really think that you are. You speak more languages than you realize. There, there are so many languages. In the 7,000 members of plus of First Baptist Church Indian Trail, there are a lot more languages here than you happen to think about or can imagine. You see, uh, God has put people around you, put people in your path, put people in your life that you can reach. Now, I can only speak English, uh, and, and that's not very good sometimes. Uh, sometimes my mountain dialect uh, gets in there, and, and, and people wonder what in the world uh, that I have said sometimes. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, you as a church speak dozens of languages. For instance, uh, we, have a, we have a group that meet here usually every Tuesday morning and Wednesday evening called Be Still Mama. Now, those, uh, those young women come to this church and they have a special language that they speak and it's called Mommy Language. They speak Mommy. Uh, we have another group called 316 Sports. And man, you, you talk about various languages. Some of them will speak soccer. Some of them will speak basketball. Others will speak football. We have some uh, that will uh, speak track. And, and, and just all kinds of languages. You may speak golf. You may have the language of golf. You may have the language of uh, sales. You may have the language of uh, mechanics. And you uh, know about carburetors and you know about 
uh, exhaust pipes and those kinds of things. And then some of you, God help you, uh, speak math. And, and, and some of you speak uh, uh, the, the language of accounting. Now, I want to tell you, I don't understand that language. I uh, never have understood a whole lot uh, of that language. Some of you have the language of an artist. Many of you have a language of a musician. Guess what? I got good news for you. God expects you to use the language that you speak to others in that language about the great things that God has done in your life, the great things that God has done in your family, the great things that God has done in your church. One of the things that I just really am excited about is uh, Matthew Slimp, uh, our uh, minister of music here at First Baptist. Is, uh, he's planning uh, on another activity that's going to show up sometime this fall, and it's a music academy. And, and they're going to speak piano. And, and they're going to speak s- strings. And they're going to speak wind instruments. And, and, and it's going to be a language that is going to touch a segment of our culture that we're trying to reach in a way that nothing else is going to be able to touch. And all we're doing in those languages that you and I have, it is a bridge between our lives their lives, and the things of God. And we bridge those gaps with that language. By the way, can I just say to you, you don't have to be a great theologian. Yeah, you don't have to have memorized all of the scriptures. You don't have to understand all of the doctrines. Uh, all you have to do is to speak the language that you know about. Talk about what you know. Now, let me give you the third. You ready? We have to deploy our gifts. Deploy our gifts. Look at verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. (laughs) Now, you might laugh at this. You understand Simon Peter is throwing in a little humor into his speech. And he says, now, boys, it's not possible for these people to be drunk. It's only, it's only about 9 o'clock in the morning here, and the pubs haven't opened up yet. The bars haven't opened up. They're not drunk. So he's providing a little bit of humor here. And, and, and then he goes on to say, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons. Listen, your sons, you ought to underline that word. Your daughters, underline that word. They shall prophesy. And your young men, underline that, shall see visions. And your old men, underline that, shall dream dreams and on my servants and on my handmaidens there we go servants and handmaidens underline that i will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy going down to verse 21 it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the lord shall be saved so he says you young you old you sons you daughters all of you servants I'm going to use every one of you to fulfill the purpose that I have designed just for you and your life. And that purpose you'll discover is in verse 21 is that in order for people to be saved, I'm going to use everybody who names my name. Now, I want to just say something before I go on to number four. If you're going to serve at First Baptist Church Indian Trail... If you're going to be a part of this fellowship, don't think that you could come in here and just sit down on a seat somewhere and be a spectator and watch everything else going on. No, no, no. Well, we're going to make sure that you understand that there is a big work to do and that God has a purpose and a plan for you and you've been gifted with at least one spiritual gift that God intends to deploy into his army for his glory 
to reach people with the gospel. All right, number four, you ready for this one? You got to dig into God's word. Look at verse 42. You got to dig into God's word. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Now, now what is the apostles' doctrine? That's the Bible. Uh, The people uh, dug into the word of God and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Now, let me just say to all of you here today, if you want the blessings of God on your life, if you want the blessings of God in your family, if you want the blessings of God in your church, You've got to stay in the Word of God. You've got to dig into the precepts and the principles of the Word of God. We've got to be people of the book. Now, by the way, let me just stop right here for just a minute. I'm not just talking about studying the Bible. I'm talking about living the Bible. I'm not just talking about knowing scriptures. I'm talking about doing scriptures doing faith you you understand faith without works is dead so we must be not just hearers of the word the bible says we've got to be doers of the word can i just say to you that there is no message in the world that can change people's lives like the gospel message I I picked out a few things, and and, and I've written them down. I'm going to read them to you for just a minute. But just some things that jumped out. If you read uh, Simon Peter's sermon, here's some of the things that you're going to find in his sermon. He says that Jesus is God, and his miracles proved it. That's in verse 22. He said that Jesus died on the cross for us in verse 23. In verse 24, he raised him back to life. Then you can see that the gospel gives gladness and joy and hope in verse 26. And then you read in this that he sent the Spirit of God from heaven to man. Uh, You see in the passage that in order to receive salvation, in order to go to heaven, you must repent of those sins and ask for forgiveness and be baptized. And then you discover that in the second chapter that God puts his Holy Spirit inside of us. And then he gives us the power that you and I can live differently. Find this in verse 40, that you and I can live differently than the rest of the world. The good news is this. The gospel message is this. Your sins can be forgiven. Your past can be forgiven and you're given a reason for living today and then God plants in you the hope of heaven. And I thank God for it. Now let me give you number five. Deeply love each other. Watch this in verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. That word fellowship is the word koinonia. It translates very easily as family. You understand that this early church cared deeply for each other. They loved each other. May I say to all of you that are listening, listen, if you really want the blessings of God on your life, if you want God's hand to stay on your family and your business and your church, you've got to love the body of Christ. You've got to love the family of God. Now, the Roman Empire in this day never understood the family of God. They thought they were quirky. Uh, Matter of fact, they they even referred to them as cannibals from time to time when they got to thinking about, uh, take, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. And, And they translated that, took it completely out of context and called them a bunch of cannibals said it's the weirdest people that they've ever known. But even the Roman Empire could not deny that the people of God had a deep love for one another. They had each other's back. They had each other's six. Uh, they, They knew that they would stick together and they could depend on one another. 
Let me ask you something. Do do you think that that's uh, the way it is today when our culture thinks about Christians? Uh, What are we known for today? It it bothers me just a little bit uh, that maybe the body of Christ, maybe the family of God is known more for what they are against than what they are for. Uh, No no more what we stand against than what we stand for. Now, I don't know about you, but I do know this. I sure do miss the family of God. One reason I miss, I'm a hugger. I I am. I'm just a hugger. And and even now, it's the hardest thing. That, that I, I, I just want to put my arms around people. I want to just love on them and I want to hug them. And, and I'll start, man, full force. I'm headed and I can see that look in their eye. And it, no, I, I just can't wait till this stuff is over with and we can get back to being the family of God. Do you know that in, two times in the New Testament, the Bible says that you and I are to greet one another with a holy kiss? Now, now that lasted about the first 300 years of New Testament Christianity and some deadhead preachers decided, well, it might cause people to lust. And so they uh, said, let's just hug. And then it wasn't long after that until even that practice was gone and they lost it all together. Here's what I've come to believe. And here's why I believe that church has been uh, dealt a little bit a more serious blow Here's one of the reasons I believe that uh, businesses uh, are considered essential and the church is not essential is because our government just does not understand that brotherly and sisterly affection is vital for the spiritual well-being of God's people. No wonder, no wonder, no wonder. The Bible says don't forsake the assembly of yourselves together as the manner of some is, exhorting one another, lifting each other up, and even more so when you see that we're living in those last days. Look at verse 44. Uh, And all that belonged, or excuse me, and all that were believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. See the deep love that they had for one another. Let me give you number six. You must demonstrate your love for God in worship. In Acts chapter 2, the Bible says that they worshiped joyfully, with gladness and joy. Can can I just say to you, you can't have the joy of the Lord about you and not participate in corporate worship with gladness and with gratitude. Look look at verse 28. Uh, I know we're skipping around a lot, but just watch this. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with my countenance, with the way that people see me. I just want to say this before I go on. God wants our worship to be joyful. Look at verse 26. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope let me let me just tell you there are two reasons that you ought to worship joyfully number one it's good for my well-being it's good for your well-being and it's good as a witness to other people you know there are two reasons why people today reject Jesus Christ and don't believe in him and don't put their faith in him. The the first reason is, is that they have never run into a Christian. The second reason people reject Jesus is because they have run into a Christian. Why? Because there's just some people that are just cranky, and they'll look at some old cranky Christian, and they'll say, if that's all the difference that Jesus can make, Forget that. And they'll see some sourpuss expression. Do you know that some people are just poor witnesses in their worship because they're just, do I dare say this? 
they're just spiritually constipated. They're just all bound up. And, and they need to be freed up. Can, can I just say a word to all of you here this morning? Don't wait, don't, don't wait until we get all back together before you get alone with God and worship Him and lift up your hands and praise His name. Let me ask you, where would you be today if Jesus had not saved your soul? Worship Him. Praise Him joyfully and with gladness. Let, let me give you number seven. You ready? Determine to live sacrificially. If you look at verse 44 and 45, the Bible says that they sold a bunch of land and they gave, now I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here because God knows that you're giving. God knows that you're sacrificing. God knows that you've been faithful. And, and, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here, but you say, well, preacher, I don't have any land to sell and I don't have any money to give. Well, let me ask you a question. Sacrificing doesn't always entail finances. Let me ask you, do you have any time to give? Because, friend, there are a lot of people right now that are sheltered in place. There are a lot of people that can't go to the grocery store. There are the elderly that can't get out. They, they are confined that they could sure use somebody to go to the store and buy them some groceries. My wife just did that for somebody just the other day, and I've never been more proud of her. Gave half of her day just ministering to somebody else. Do you have any time that you could give? Let me ask you, do you have any love? People are starved to death to know that somebody cares. All right, let me give you number eight. Dare to lead your friends to Jesus. Look at verse 40 and 41. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Hey, you know, Matthew, uh, you and I get a lot of probably uh, slanders about being in a mega church. And, and, and I've even heard it, why well, this church is too big. I could never go to a mega church. D do you know that from day one, the church was a mega church? The first day in existence, 3,000 became part of the church. Been a mega church since the very beginning of the kingdom of God in Pentecost. Look at verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved now I want you to see that little phrase in there having favor with all the people in other words the lost people saw something in the children of God that they liked you got that the lost person saw something in the saved people that caused them to like what they saw. How many of you have a friend or family member that is on their way to hell? Can, can I just say, they will not like what you say until they like what they see. And when they like what they see, they will most likely like what they hear. Let them see the difference in you. Let them see Jesus in you. How do I do that? Well, I hope that you know that they're looking for something that's genuine. They're looking for something that's real. You need to be transparent before them. You don't have to be perfect, but you've got to be real. They'll see through anything that's phony and false. And they've seen enough of that. They just want to see something that is bona fide. And they need to see that you love them. Can I just say to all of you, who's your one? You remember, we're still doing that. Who's your one? Hmm. Your one will come to Jesus when you show them that you love them. I don't know about you, but I still want the hand of God on my life. I want him to use me. I want to worship him with joy and gladness in my heart. I, I want others to see 
that Jesus has made a genuine difference in my life and I want people to come to faith in Jesus as a result of what God can do through me to touch them. How about you? Let's go to God in prayer. Father, I just want to say thank you. Thank you that your hand is on my life. Thank you that your hand is on my family. Thank you that your hand is on my church. Oh, God, please don't remove your hand. And Lord, if you'll give us the power, if you'll rest on us, we'll be careful to do everything that you've instructed us to do to the best of our ability, empowered by your Holy Spirit, to reach this world for Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, help us to seek you and put you first. Now your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. Would you right now in the confines of wherever you may be, would you simply say, Lord Jesus, I want you in my life. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. I receive you gladly and joyfully and with your help. Father, I'll live for you for the rest of my life. If you prayed that prayer with me right now, just thank God. Say, Lord, thank you that you have forgiven me of my sin. Thank you that you have come into my heart. Thank you that you have saved me. Oh, friend, if you prayed that prayer, it's the greatest prayer you'll ever pray. Would you take time just in these next few minutes and go to our website and would you let me know that you've prayed to receive Jesus as your Savior and in your Lord? All right? Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.